This video is brought to you by Boksu. If you've ever wanted to sink your teeth into the unique, flavorful culture of Japan, check out the link in the description. Hey everyone, Gaijin Goomba here, and welcome back to another episode of Yokai Hunters, where Japanese monster media meet to unravel the origins behind gaming and anime's coolest characters. Hmm. Back to the Tanuki well, I see. You... Alright, look. What do you want from me? Tanuki are my absolute favorite yokai of all time for a great number of reasons that mayhaps I'll talk about in my brand new secondary channel, Guys Your Perspective. Seriously, go check it out. I love making those videos. But for right now, I'm just gonna say I love them. I collect them. I made a homebrew playable race on them. I play said race in a D&D session. And if you ask any YouTuber what they make their content on, it's always what they love. Also, also, it's not my fault that video games keep introducing the folklore creature over and over and over again. Super Mario Bros. 3, Pocky and Rocky, Link's Awakening, Sly Cooper, Animal Crossing, Parodius, Taiko no Tatsujin, Tanuki Justice, Omyoji, and finally, we not only have a new Tanuki to the video game roster, but a one-to-one -one of the most hardcore in folklore, Danzaburo, the newest deity to arrive on the third-person folklore-inspired MOBA, Smite. Wait, didn't we already talk about him back in the Animal Crossing episode with Tom Nook and Red? Yeah, but that doesn't mean I haven't found new stuff to talk about. I found that every popular media iteration of a folklore character always adds or bends something new to analyze. And Smite's interpretation of the Supreme Commander of Sato Island's Tanuki is no exception. Although, yes, there's gonna be some slight repeat information, so whatever. But before we tear into the history and culture of this scruffy trickster, I'd encourage you all to tear into the history and culture and surprisingly rich flavor of bulk suit. Oh yeah, we're back at it again with one more special message from the folks behind what I can only describe as cultural analysis in snack form. See, every Boksu box comes with up to 25 different snacks. But these aren't your big food company products like Haichu, Paki, or Kinoko no Yama. These are handcrafted specializations from families that have been doing it for over a hundred years from all corners of the country. And not only do you get some amazing insight into what and where each snack comes from, but each box has its own cultural theme. Everyone starts off with the Seasons of Japan box that features traditional favorites from festivities all across the country, but other boxes specialize in individual places and seasons, like the Summer Okinawa and Autumn Harvest boxes. This time, though, I was treated to the Winter of Hokkaido box, chock full of local delectables like my personal favorites, the Hokkaido Milk Manchu, Meiji Mochi Puffs, and the Toltepo Sable Cookies. But also included in each box is a booklet of not only the location and history behind each snack, but cultural tidbits built around each theme. In my case, the cultural booklet that I got with the Hokkaido Winter Box features information from a multitude of Hokkaido's famous snow festivals. Like I said, cultural analysis in snack form. Personally, I'm grabbing a box or two for my family for the holidays, because these aren't just sugary snacks, they're very much an experience, with each item having a unique texture and flavor that anchors them to a unique part of Japan. So if you want to get your hands on this cultural snack attack for yourself, or for a loved one for the holidays, check out the link in the description and use the code GAIJIN10 to get 10% off your purchase, with a savings of up to 47 bucks. Shipping's free and you can cancel at any time. So come take a literal bite out of Japan's culture. Alright, so with all that out of the way, let me explain what this guy in this game is all about. Danzaburu is a new member to the game's hunter role. Characters that specialize in ranged, non-magical combat whose abilities typically hamper the movement of enemy players or gets themselves out of sticky situations, with Danzaburo being the poster child for this kind of gameplay. This of course being on top of also blasting above-mentioned enemy players with a giant bamboo hand cannon and a makeshift bamboo heat-seeking rocket. He's goofy, quirky, always reveling at jokes at other people's expense, and as we've seen in the teaser animation that came before his release, an exceedingly crafty creature of business. You mean thievery. Eh, perspectives. Well, well, that's all well and good for what most people would write off as a more charismatic rocket raccoon. Let me tell you what Don Zabuto was really about. Don Zabuto Danuki is an interesting take on the ultra popular Kanid Yokai. Because for everything that typical Tanuki were known for, the Supreme Commander of Sado is very characteristically different from his brethren. Dan Saburo's story starts off on the mainland of Japan, where he took on the illusion of a fur trader and brought with him several Tanuki to theoretically be poached on the island. Yet, in actuality, Dan Saburo had successfully relocated his entire 100-strong clan of Tanuki in an attempt to escape the horrors that were dogs, their human masters, and the greatest of Tanuki rivals, Kitsune Foxes. 
But that isn't to say that Don Zaburo mistreated or was mistreated by the humans who lived on Sado. Granted, Don Zaburo did have his share of folk stories where he would create illusions to confuse, fool, and otherwise harass antagonistic humans, but Don Zaburo was known as a good-hearted moneylender to the poor fishermen of the island. Some legends say that he traveled to old rundown sites like temples and shrines, found forgotten relics and treasures, then pawned them off at his illusionary grand estate to travelers for gold, which he would then lend out to the poor. Others say, though, that he swindled the rich using his illusionary magic and silver tongue. Though if historian Orito is to be believed, Tansaburo would always return that which he, quote, borrowed from people, with a promissory note of the date in which he would return the pilfered money. But this didn't mean Tansaburo was one to be taken advantage of. He and his clan kept a very close eye on the loans that they gave out to the people of Sado. Though he never threatened to break anyone's kneecaps over it, Tansaburo was known to completely clasp his coin purse shut should an individual not make good on a loan. I guess you could say, in a weird sort of way, he was like a good-natured Ebenezer Scrooge of the yokai world. Ah, good. Solid holiday pull there, buddy. Much topical. So, now that we have some grinding between the Don Zaburo of Smite and the Don Zaburo of Legend, let's get into some of the fine details and see just how much homework hi did with the source material. I think the best place to start is going to be in the physical design. Not only because it's the first thing that your eyeballs are going to see, but also because it's in the design of the characters of Smite where cultural inspiration really shines through. Smite's Don Zaburo appears to have on a weaved wide brim hat, a kamiko haori or paper coat, and below that, a kosode or short sleeve kimono. This was an Edo style of clothing typically worn by cholnin or townsfolk involved in business and industry, something that tradesmen would wear. Eh, yeah, curious enough, right? But have a look at the pack that Don Zaburo's carrying around his back. From behind, it looks like he's got a sword, a scroll, and a few jugs in there. Now, he doesn't ever use these in games, so maybe, just maybe, he's selling those. We already know from the animated short that he's a crafty seller of goods, so mayhaps then his backpack is full of treasures similar to those of the folklore Don Zaburo, who also trickly sold treasures to tarrying travelers? Finally, we got the bamboo pole with the hanging tanuki inscribed lantern, a direct parallel to a traveling salesman's advertising mechanisms. As far as I can tell, Don Zaburo from Smite pulls so many mercantile references, how could he not be associated with the money lending merchant Don Zaburo of folklore? Hey, wait a second. There, right there on the back left of Don Zaburo's backpack. That's the same kind of promissory notes that Shigaraki Tanuki are constantly seen with. Well, yet another connection to the Don Zaburo folklore who would leave promissory notes to those he swindled. Moving on, hanging from Don Zaburo's belt, which strikingly is similar to Haori Himo, are two jugs of sake. How can I tell it's sake? Well, because it straight up says so. But let's not beat around the bush here. These are clearly a metaphor for one of the Tanuki's greatest <coughs> assets. Which I find kind of disappointing because the massive bags that the Tanuki has has nothing to do with anything lewd, but rather a centuries old metallurgy joke. Nah, seriously, go look it up. Alrighty, but what about the big screw-off gun that Don Zabuto totes around? I don't exactly recall massive matchlocks being a regular in Tanuki repertoire. Not often, anyway. Well, it's like Donza says in-game. The man with the bigger gun always wins. Oh, in this case, the Tanuki. And the gun he carries is no casual affair. This is a Bohia. See, by the mid-1500s, Japan had developed an interesting obsession with firearms technology that greatly shaped the rest of the Warring States period in the country, leading to the creation of this new style of fire arrow. The metal rocket was wrapped in a highly flammable waterproof rope covered by paper and then tipped with a fuse, which was then loaded and fired from an old Tsutsu matchlock hand cannon that gave it a huge amount of velocity. The heavy aerodynamic nature of the arrow and the oomph power behind the Otsutsu hand cannon meant that this arm-length source of fire could puncture through wood and stone with great ease, setting structures and ships aflame in the blink of an eye. Ah, so something Oda Nobunaga would have sold his sister for. Alright, highbrow historical joke. Check! How about them abilities? Well, all of Don Zaburo's in-game abilities, as well as his character in general, seem to revolve around two things. Money and alcohol. For the earlier, dubious savings gives old Danza a power increase determined by how much gold he picks up over time, while the fool's gold ability causes enemy players to drop money while also getting hit by an intoxication debuff, and then take explosive damage when the bags blow up. These two abilities are absolutely indicative of Danza Buddha from folklore's history with money. As we mentioned before, Danza Buddha was scrupulous with his gold, not only keeping well-observed records of both his debtors and creditors, but also making a booming business for himself of cashing in old relics that he would find across Sado Island, likely using his illusionary abilities to fudge the market worth of his wares. 
Similarly, does the dubious savings ability depend on a finite track of your inbound currency, and the fool's gold ability itself making a cultural hint to Danzaburo's tales of, quote, stealing other people's money through illusionary means. Right, but what about all this booze talk with the alluring spirits ability? I don't exactly recall Danzaburo of legend having any strong ties with sake. Well, that's because he really didn't. The sake motif has a more generalized meaning with Tanuki. Now, the ability in question has Danzaburo taking a hit off his Tolkuri bottle and then lobbing on the battlefield which slows and taunts enemies. Rather than this coming from Danzaburo being a high swagger salesman of sake, I think this, as well as all jabs at Tanuki being lovable drunkards, comes primarily from a handful of word of mouth folk songs. Sato Island, home of Danzaburo himself, has one such song of a Tanuki going out to buy sake. But the most famous song of a raccoon dog shopping for spirits comes from Kyoto and the surrounding area. A little ditty about a scrappy tanuki named Mameda who made a sake salesman cry when they realized that the money that Mameda used to purchase his wares turned out to be leaves. I guess the same thing could be said about Danzaburo's third ability, Tanuki Trickery, which creates that small patch of greenery that ups his speed, makes him immune to slows, and makes him take less damage. And should anyone get up in his grill, they get slowed and Danza walks out of the arena turning into one of several leaves as an escape. Yeah, I remember tearing into the book of Yokai by Michael Foster and discovering that there was a guy from an island in Kagoshima Prefecture who recalled a story of another man who was basically tricked into riding a phantom train from one side of the island to the other, created by a mischievous Tanuki. Cause yeah, Tanuki can get a little too crazy with their magics, creating entire landscapes of illusions. Yeah, and this whole leaf motif, it really is weird where the Tanuki trope came from. As far as the Tanuki putting leaves on their head in order to transform, that was loosely taken from an 1879 art piece by Kawanabe Kyosai, while the whole transformation using leaves in general was actually taken from the Tanuki's folklore cousin, the Kitsune. In the Soushinki, a localized 4th century Chinese script, a monk was passing by a graveyard and saw a fox attempting to balance a skull and a bunch of bones on its head. And after balancing itself, it covered its body in leaves and transformed into a beautiful woman one of many stories that time has conflagrated into Tanuki tales. Which brings us to a handful of voice lines worth breaking down. Do not compare me to a kitsune. We Tanuki are the best. Don't you forget it. Ah yes, the Kori no Tatakai. See, when it comes to old yokai folklore, there's a distinct and sometimes very bloody rivalry between Tanuki and Kitsune, and the battles between the two becoming known as the Kori no Tatakai, or literally the Battle of Tanuki and Kitsune. Named so for when one mashes together the kanji for kitsune and the kanji for tanuki, you get kori. Which itself has other meanings like a sly person, divination, and what have you, but I digress. There is no bigger poster child for the kori no tatakai than Danzaburo. Remember how we mentioned that he took his entire clan to Sato Island to get away from dogs, humans, and kitsune? Well, he was gonna make sure that kitsune never stepped foot on Sato. In one tale, while returning from the mainland, Danzaburo found a kitsune looking for a way onto Sato. The fox saw that Danza had a boat and asked to be taken on ashore. Danza Buru agreed, but only if the fox transformed into a coat in order to ease suspicion from the locals. However, about halfway out from shore, Danza Buru casually tossed the coat form fox in the sea where it drowned horribly as Danza casually paddled away. And if you think that's rough, check this out. In another story, Danza Buru caught a gloating kitsune near Futatsu Iwa on Sato Island and challenged the fox to a duel of transformations. Cause as an old saying goes, the fox has seven disguises, the tanuki has eight. Danzaburo boasted that he could transform into an entire warlord's procession, a feat that the kitsune doubted but accepted on the challenge. Just as Danzaburo disappeared out of sight, a grand daimyo procession emerged from where he had disappeared to. Utterly shocked, the kitsune ran over to the daimyo's palakin and kicked it repeatedly in disbelief from the illusion. Except it wasn't an illusion, it was absolutely real and Tanzaburo merrily whistled to himself walking away as the kitsune was cut to ribbons. Yeah, there's that much detailed folklore in this one freaking line. Guess that you should probably watch your back when this little fuzzball's on the field. There's a handful of other things we could go on about, such as other voice lines or alternate skins, but I think y'all get the point. Although I've always been garbage at MOBAs, Smite has always intrigued me with how deceptively complex each and every character is designed with folklore in mind, and Tanzaburo was absolutely no exception. 
Heck, I might stream an attempt to, quote, get good once this little furball comes out, because, like I said, I'm just a sucker for Tanuki. And hey, speaking of suckers and other sweets, please don't forget, if you want to get your hands on a box of regionally rich snacks from Japan that you can't get anywhere else, be sure to check out that link in the description and use the code GAIJIN10 to get 10% off your bulk soup purchase. It supports the rich, delicious heritage of Japan and supports our ability to keep making these kinds of videos. But as always, everyone, thanks for watching. Be sure to check out my second channel, Gaijin Perspective, to get a bit more of a personalized look into my experiences in the land of the rising sun. And be sure to check out our streams every Tuesday, Saturday, and Sunday at 7 p.m. U.S. Central Time. But until next time, everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.